Okay. My clock says six o'clock, even though it feels like it's nine. Oh, daylight savings. Anyways, welcome to the November 9th, 2023 regular scheduled city council meeting. May I please have a roll call? Thank you. Council Member Brooks? Here. Council Member Clark? Here. Council Member Peterson? Here. Vice Mayor Brown? Here. And Mayor Kaiser? Here. Would you all please join in the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any additions or deletions? Staff has no changes to the agenda this evening. Thank you. And additional materials. The City Council received three emails related to item 7D on tonight's agenda. The emails were incorporated into the agenda packet and were emailed to the Council prior to the meeting. Great. Thank you. So we'll move on to oral communications. This is uh, for members of the public. You can speak on anything on general government, or sorry, on consent items, um, just not on general government or anything of not on the agenda. And you will have three minutes. My name is Goran Klepic. I used to work for Zelda Security here one time a while ago. There was a problem back then uh, that I want to address here in the meeting. There were uh, substantial amounts of cocaine being pushed around by uh, cocaine dealers. And I don't know if the authorities knew about it. I still stand by it, what I say tonight. I don't care if it has repercussions, but I know what I saw. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great day. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Chris Hampson. Uh, my family lives in Capitola, and I have four kids uh, that all frequent our public library. Um, first, we love our library. It's an extremely valuable asset to our community. Uh, I'm here to comment on the resolution against banning books in the Santa Cruz Public Library system. This is actually something that's on the agenda, so you will have a chance um, for public comment on 7A. I'm sorry, I saw it on tonight's agenda for item number 7A. Yeah, we're still up at uh, at four on oral communications, so we will be revisiting that. Um, oh, so I do I speak at that time? Yeah. I apologize. No worries. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. I'm Tony Campbell, and I'm speaking to you tonight also on the subject of the library, but very different from banning the books. I'm um, representing the Friends of the Capitola Library, and i got good news for you. Um, you. Some of you may remember that when the initial construction papers came out, um, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the, as drawn, there wasn't enough money to do everything that was in the plans. And the city value engineered stuff very nicely, including they, um, they didn't put on solar panels on the roof. And I'm here to tell you that the Friends of the Capitol Library ha have now had the money to fund solar panels for the Capitol Library. It makes me really happy. For the last six and a half years, the Friends of the Capitola Library, a small band of about two or three dozen people, have been operating a bookstore in the Capitola Mall where we sell books, mostly for one and two dollars a piece. People love the library or the, the bookstore. We want to know that 
that we now have quite a bit of money. So this is what we have. Uh, Gail Ortiz and I kept uh, aside 51, almost $51,000 from the capital campaign, which the city is holding. And in addition, we have about $350,000 that we've earned in these last six and a half years, which is a sizable amount of money at one and two dollars a piece. Um, in August, our group formally voted to spend our money to install the solar panels on the um, on the building. Something quite exciting, and I think you know something. Martha Stewart would say it's a good thing. Um, we had hoped that the city uh, could take on management of the project, but you know the uh, you know with the water problems, with all the stuff that's going on, that doesn't seem to be possible. And we are really grateful to Jamie to be working with the uh, county, Nicole and Carlos, uh, Carlos, I hope, um, uh, to to take the project because we would prefer that the library staff did not do it, just, they just don't have the bandwidth. But there you go. Um, I hope to uh, see you when those things are installed and we have a good party. And one of the things, one, just quickly, if you could, that's a little um, information about our bookstore, which you are very welcome to visit anytime. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Esther Phillips, but I'm not sure if I should be here right at the moment. But um, I'm here for the consent items, number E. So should I wait for that? Nope, now's your time. Yes, okay. Thank you. Way down, okay. <laughs> All right, it's um, regarding the 1098 38th Avenue Project mid-pen. And um, there are several um, residents there are very, very concerned about the proposal and uh, what it will bring to our little tiny 38th Avenue, that, which is now a highway, 38th Highway. Um, there is no lighting. There is um, no sidewalk on the east side. There is um, no crosswalks. One for the section that we're talking about. It's about a mile and a quarter of section from from Brahmer to Portola. Uh, I and others cannot walk safely on that street with our dog, with ourselves, without you know being afraid that we're going to trip over something or you know how you how you lose your step when you're walking because there is no sidewalk and there is no lighting and the cars go by real fast. Honestly. I had a representative from Midpen come yesterday, and she did see the crazy traffic on 38th Avenue that, that I'm speaking of. And Midpen is 1098, and it's in the city, but our roads are county. Isn't that great? So um, we need something done here because you guys need to talk to each other. Because someone is going to get killed, and it might be me and my dog Lenny. Who knows? But then you guys will go, oh. Yeah, maybe the uh, crosswalk should be put in there. Oh, maybe some lighting should be put in there, especially when there's a 52-unit going up. And I know it hasn't really been approved yet, but we know it's going to be approved. We're not naive in you know, all us residents there. And there's, there is seven mobile home parks there, and two of them are 55-plus over, and the other five are all age. So you're bringing in 300 or 300-plus 300 more people, uh, 100 more vehicles, what we are, are dealing with. So you, you know, all really honestly need to, to think about what's going on here. If you're going to put the units up, fine. It's even a three-story unit, crazy as it seems. But you've really, really got to work with the county uh, uh, public works about that, about the road, because it just can't hold all of it. Not what, can't even hold what's doing now. It's not going to hold you know, safely, any more people on that street. Wheelchairs, there's no bike lanes, e-bikes go by, and then we have that railroad track at 1098, and people, you know, I was young once too, and we would just fly over the railroad tracks and go even faster. So that's what you got. You know, lots of people driving fast and um, not looking at the road signs. There's not even good signage for that matter. 
So I'm asking you, whenever you are going to, I don't know, approve this, what's it say here? The loan agreement, yeah. That and whatever else goes along with it, you've got to stop and think about this traffic issue that, that we're heading in for. You know, so that's what I'm asking you to do. Thank you so much. Thanks. Me, I'm asking, but a lot of residents on 38th are asking as well. Thank you. Good evening, council, staff. My name is Lori Hill. I serve as one of your arts and cultural commissioners and have enjoyed the ride all along. Uh, I am here during public comment to uh, present to you the two pieces of art that the city uh, has taken into their collection as a result of Capitola Plein Air that took place over October 30th through November 5th. Those two pieces are hanging on the wall right over there. The first place was Christian Matthews, and that's the magical forest. He's the one that's in the middle there. Um, that's Nicene Marks, and uh, this is a, is, a, is a gifted artist. Our judge also selected for second place uh, Loisa Lorenz. Her piece is called The View. Um, Loisa came from Texas, uh, excuse me, from Utah to paint with us this year. So it was a wonderful event. Um, it was our eighth annual year. The first year that we did this event, we sold no paintings. <laughs> um, now at the eighth year, we're selling 45 plus. Um, 70 artists applied to be a part of the event. We could only handle 40. Uh, it's a, a, it's an ex a wonderful example of collaboration between a lot of agencies. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce was there presenting a special recognition. So was the Capitola Village Improvement Association. Um, uh, uh, Palace Arts was there doing all kinds of great activities. It's, it's a great event, and I hope that you will support it again for next year. Thank you. Great, thank you. Hello, Mayor, Council. I've made it five years without coming to a council meeting. I'm feeling very proud of myself, but here I am. Um, I came to thank you, staff, uh, the Recreation Department, Public Works, the Police Department, for the most capital event I've ever witnessed, and that was JoJo's birthday party. Well done. It was everything about Capitola, everything about small town, and uh, it filled our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other public comments? I don't see any. Okay, we can take this to staff. Any staff comments? I'd just like to reiterate the comments by Mr. Termini there and thank my staff for organizing that amazing event this week for JoJo's 80th birthday. It was really one of those things that reminds us all, I think, about why, why this is such an important and special place. Thank you. And I'll go to council. Any council comments? Go for it. Yeah, I'd like to um, ask staff to come back to us um, regarding the Children's Bill of Rights. The city of Santa Cruz has um, worked really hard in rounding out the program that could potentially be an extension of the program or the policy, no, the resolution we just adopted. Um, and I'd like to see a student ambassador program come to Capitola. So you can bring information back on their program and how we can essentially bring that to Capitola. Thank you. Um, I just wanna say that um, there is some progress happening on even the front of the wharf. I found that out via our city Instagram page. So. Thank you for that knowledge and those posts. Um, so follow us if you want some more fun Wharf Wednesday information. Um, there is progress. And um, yes, I realize it is slow, but it is happening. So just keep that in mind. And thank you for your patience. Okay, we will move on to consent. 
Um, all these items listed as consent will be enacted by one motion in the form listed below, unless a council member wishes to pull an item. I'll move consent items 6A through E. Second. We have a first and a couple seconds. May we just do a voice vote? All those in favor say aye. 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 That passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll move on to general government. Item 7A, this is the resolution against banning materials. The recommended action tonight is to adopt a resolution against banning books and materials in the Santa Cruz Public Library System. This was an item that was continued from our last meeting. Julia's. That would be me, yes. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Um, to start us off this evening, we'll be going over this item that was continued from the October 26th. Council meeting. So for background, uh, on October 11th, the City Council received a request from the Library Advisory Commission to adopt a resolution against banned materials in the Santa Cruz Public Library System. As a part of the request, the request included a copy of a draft resolution that was presented. During our October 12th regular City Council meeting, Vice Mayor Brown requested that staff bring forth this item for City Council consideration. On October 26th, during our regular city council meeting, we received requests from members of the public to pull the item for further discussion. Council member Clark pulled the item for discussion following the public comment period. The item was then continued to tonight's city council meeting. Because this was a staff request or a council requested item, there is not much staff recommendation associated with it. So the recommended action would be to adopt the resolution as was requested by Vice Mayor Brown. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Do we have any council questions? Seeing none, we can go to public comment on this item. You will have three minutes. Okay, hello, uh, I already signed in, so. Um, okay, so my name's Chris Hampton. My family lives in Capitola. I have four kids that all frequent our Capitola Public Library, and again, to reiterate, we love our library. It's a very valuable asset to our community. Uh, I am here to comment on this resolution against banning books in the public library system. Um, I would iterate that first, I think most of us would agree that banning books is not a good thing. Um, the reason we have our library is to provide books uh, for our community, not ban them. Uh, it's important to recognize that our library is available to everybody and that everybody does have access to the materials in our library. With that being said, some of the books that have recently come into this discussion are not age appropriate uh, to be in a public library. Uh, just like we don't allow our children to purchase adult magazines in our liquor stores, uh, we shouldn't be providing these books to children in our public library. I'm sorry if I'm talking too close to this. Again, this is not about banning books. Uh, I think this is about books that should be provided that are age appropriate for the people in our library. Um, I have one of these books in question. Uh, this book here is called Gender Queer. I came across this because it's a controversial book that is being allowed in other libraries. Um, this book is written as an autobiography and um, I'll hold it up and show you this is entirely cartoons, right? This book is intended for children. Um, I'm gonna apologize in advance for a brief passage out of this book. Uh, I got a new strap-on harness today. I can't wait to put it on you. It will fit my dildo perfectly. You're going to look so hot. I can't wait to have your C-O-C-K in my mouth. I'm going to give you the BJ of your life. Then I want you inside me. Okay, that's a children's book. I think most of us would agree the language in this is not what we want our children reading. Yet without some kind of oversight into what books are offered in a public library, this is exactly the kind of content that we're arguing should not be made available to our children. Again, I want to iterate this is not about banning books. This is simply making sure that the books we provide in our library are age appropriate. If parents want their children to have access to books like this, they're free to get them on Amazon or in a bookstore. We should not use our public library for this. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council and Mayor Kaiser. My name is Paula Bradley. I'm a resident of Capitola. 
I wholeheartedly support the resolution against banning books and materials in the Santa Cruz public library system. At the last city council meeting on October 26, which I attended remotely, I was naively surprised to hear speakers proposing banning books. I know that the politically motivated efforts to ban books for the last few years has accelerated, but naive because I was surprised that it's happening in our small city, like everywhere else in the country. Thank you to the council and Kristen Brown for bringing forth this ordinance, although it is sad that it is necessary. Book banning is censorship. Banning books under the guise of protecting children is an easy first step on the path to fascism as evidenced through history, most famously by the Nazis. Everyone wants to protect children. That is not the point of a book ban. Book bans are manipulating the public to falsely believe there is a threat from a group or persons. Pick any group those who are different, race, religion, LGBTQ, gender identity, etc. The intent of this manipulation is to evoke an emotional response and outrage to an overblown perceived threat. In the bigger picture, book bans are part of a greater effort to restrict education and forms of media, the free expression of ideas and thoughts, and efforts to whitewash or rewrite history. We need more thoughtful discourse to better understand others and study historical facts to learn from the past so it is not repeated. Unfortunately, the same groups advocating for book bans have been taking over school boards, stalking members' children, making threats to edu educators and public service workers, so we're afraid to stand up to this vocal minority. Political leaders are substituting factual truths with lies and sowing division by turning groups against each other. Many of the lists of books to ban are not even in the libraries. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Council. My name is Matt Arthur, and uh, I'm actually here to show support for the idea of not banning books. Um, I think banning books, I don't think there's anybody in here that really wants to ban books. So I think that was the messaging with this whole thing, I think is, it was bad messaging. Um, if you truly want to have a more inclusive and equitable resolution, I would like to suggest the elimination in the resolution of the fifth and sixth whereas. Um, we're all about being inclusive and equitable, so I think eliminating the fifth and sixth will create a resolution I think most of us can uh, stand by. There's something to consider. Thank you. Good evening, Council Members. T.J. Welch, resident. Uh, my daughter and my grandkids live here in Capitola. First of all, I want to state that I am not in favor of banning books. However, your resolution is much more than just a statement on banning books. The resolution is about an agenda that this council has pushed since you were elected. Notice that the resolution actually contradicts itself. It states that the library plan is to be inclusive, but it is anything but inclusive. The resolution goes on to attack conservatives for their concerns about children. The only books listed in your resolution is from the LGBTQ community. It doesn't talk about classic books like To Kill a Mockingbird or Kirk Cameron's children's book that's uh, being, both of them are being targeted by uh, a group that's a little more on the liberal side. The new president of the American Library Association, who you support in here, is a self-proclaimed queer Marxist who states that her agenda and the ALA organize a collective power to wield against white supremacy imperialism to support and direct children to find their own brand of queerness. The American Library Association's Library Bill of Rights states that children should have privacy rights without parent knowledge. This is the problem. You're placing your agenda, the ALA agenda, against parents and families. Some of these books are outright pornography and like pornography should only be checked out by adults. 
We don't need librarians helping our kids find queerness. The author of Being Gender Queer, which was read earlier tonight, uh, it's listed on your resolution, uh, actually stated that she did not write the book for kids, but rather adults. Uh, it's in a little interesting because it's all uh, animated illustrations for kids, but that's what her statement was. I'm asking you tonight to change your resolution to not limit the scope of the ban of books and keep books that have pornography for adults only uh, and to keep them away from our children, uh, just like we do pornography. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak on this item? Hello again, Council. <clears throat> My name is Mike Termini. I am the chair of the um, advisory commission that brought you this resolution and developed it. And let me say that um, we are not speaking about, why, about school curriculum. That is for parents and school boards to dole out. And we specifically stay away from that. There are popular requests to ban books in all segments of this country. Oddly enough, the most frequently requested ban is for the Bible. Next is the Quran, and after that is Harry Potter. So, and I'll, as many speakers said, and I respect all of them for their opinions, um, banning books come from all sides, liberal and conservative. And I'm sorry if this resolution reads as some sort of an attack on the conservative agenda, it's not. We believe that youth access to these books um, is in the hands of the parents. But we must, as leaders, send a clear message that freedom of access in our libraries has to be preserved. To guarantee the free access of ideas that we believe in, that's easy. We all want to do that. To defend ones we disagree with, and the ones that are most abhorrent to us. That is where the real test of defending liberty comes in. And I'm telling you that we need to keep free access to our library materials. And with regard to um, adult-only material, I, I, you know, I, I must say I struggle with this. And I think that, you know, if there's a four-year-old at home under the covers with a flashlight reading Lolita, somebody needs to look at that, and it's the parents. But as far as the slippery slope of naming books, and we did purposely put the most divisive and um, some of the most questionable book titles in this resolution for a reason. And that is, just like the Supreme Court defends Nazis marching, we have to defend the worst along with the best. And if Mein Kampf is allowed to sit on library shelves as it should because we'd never be able to forget the existence of that book. Everything needs to be put out there. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. I'm Esther Phillips again. Now I wasn't going to talk on this because I did not know what was going on, but um, I'm not quite sure of this gentleman's idea about the books. But um, to ban books in that type of context, this gentleman wrote, uh, read, that really is on you. You cannot let a 12-year-old check out that type of book. You, if anything, you should have the parents should be next to them. It should be something that a parent is part of that, that process if, if this child wants that book or any other book in that type of content. I have a 12-year-old grandson, and um, I would be appalled if he was reading something like that. Like a friend told him, hey, go check out this book, and he checked it out. I would be appalled, and you all should be appalled as well if that happened to your children, grandchildren nephews, nieces. You have to think of that, not this, uh, what, do, what do they call this, uh, resolution against banning books. It's not banning books, it's banning, not even banning inappropriate books. It's saying parental control and respects 
a parent would have to be there if this child is going to check out such a, a title of a book, any type of type of book of that. And I have not done any reading of this. I just heard what I heard tonight, and I'm I'm appalled what he read to me. That's that's something in a bedroom that you would you know be with your husband or your boyfriend or you you know, girlfriend, wife, whatever. That's appalling. And you all need to think about this. You better think about this in the future, how this is done. This is, you know, and I am not appalled to any of what was said, only the age group that's going to be reading it. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak on this item? Good evening. My name is Donald Greer. I'm the community. I just to sit here and listen. I didn't know much about this, but what I can say is if, the, if someone was to come to a liquor store, was to come and say, I'm going to, instead of selling this material, I'm going to give it away, would it be okay? Would you guys be okay with that? And there's nothing different except you can go to the library and you can, you can check out this stuff that's not appropriate for children. And I'm talking about children under 12 years old be getting this material, the only difference is, is it's free. There's no cost to it. There's no, there's no, rep no one's going to be in any trouble for it. But if you were to go into a liquor store and, and go to where they have X-rated material, they can't have it out in the open for the children. So what is the difference? That's my question. Thank you. Any other speakers on this item? Good evening. Uh, my name is David Campbell. I am a pastor here in Capitola. And I uh, first want to say I was up here, I don't know, several months back. And I want to just repeat the fact that uh, I pray for you guys. And I consider our I um, encourage our congregation to pray for you as well as our leaders in the community. So I just want to start with that. But I also want to just add to what's been said here as far as book banning. Uh, I am not a fan of banning books, and uh, as a conservative and a Christian, we've been victim to, to that as well. But uh, I also, more applicable than being a pastor in the community, I'm also a grandfather uh, of young kids here in this community, and I am full in full support of, well, I want to say that, um, you know, the innocence of our children has been severely attacked and threatened in this day and age with the internet. And it's terrible with the access that kids have to uh, highly sexual content. And so I believe in the places that we still do have some control over that. Um, I don't want to ban any books, but at least have something in place with parental consent that uh, young kids can't go in and just freely access this stuff without some kind of parental consent. So I'm in full support of any kind of measure something in place to keep that. So thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that wish to speak on this item? Maybe. Evening. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm just going to reference the book, Being Magenta. My name is Mark Escobel. I'm a local here. And I'd like to point out that in that book, it solicits sex with a minor. So there's specific penal codes that specifically 288.4, which is a crime, if you are to solicit a minor for sex, to meet up for sex. But this book specifically and explicitly talks about that. Uh, there's another penal code, 288.2. And that basically is obscene material to a minor with the intent of sexual arousal and to have sex with them. So this book that's in our library promotes that. I know we're not about banning books, but we're also not about sexual misconduct with the minor. So if a book is soliciting that, you can actually be arrested if you solicit it online or if you go out and text 
and even if two minors are texting between each other to solicit sex, they can be charged under Penal Code 288. Um, let me give you one more code. For the record, Penal Code 288.2. Same thing, distribution of sexual material. So if you can't do this online, you can't do this in writing, what's the difference between a library and online access? Nothing, the library came first. So if this material is in our library and we can't do it online anywhere else because it's a crime, then why are we keeping the solicitation of minors in our libraries? And like I said, I'm not for banning books, but I am not also for promoting sexual solicitation with the minor. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public wish to speak? Seeing none, we can take it back to council deliberation. Any comments? I move approval of staff recommendation. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Passes unanimously. We can move on to item 7B. The, excuse me, we're moving on to item B. We have the 2023 special event report. We are to receive a report on 2023 special events, provide direction regarding changes to specific special event permit conditions, and improve recurring minor and general special events for 2024. We have our Captain Ryan here to present. Thank you. I won't take it personal that they're all leaving as I take the mic. This is a less, less uh, fun item here. Good evening, Council and staff. I'm here to give you the recap of the um, 2023 special events. And I just want to start with just saying that Mike, it's very sensitive, that um, pretty impressive that these events were pulled together after the rough winter that we had. So there's some event organizers in the crowd. So, I mean, kudos to them, um, the collaboration that happened and the fact that we were able to do all the things that we did were pretty incredible. So, so the purpose here is that we, um, I'm going to give you the report and we'll, and look at what's happening in 2024 and how we can move forward and just continue to improve our collaboration with the community and special events. Can you go back real quick? Please acknowledge Gail, one of our special volunteers. That's at Trunk or Treats this year. So I tried to grab photos that were actually relevant and current um, with some of the things that we had going on this year. So I thought that was really cute. All right. So just to kind of bring you to special events and, and how we got here, we have general special events for the city of Capitola, which are 200 attend attendees and more that also have uh, larger impacts to the city, public works and, and police department in particular. We're gonna circle back to that at the end. So general special events. And then minor events are less than 200 attendees with minimal impacts in the Art and Cultural Commission events and other city um, organized events. So in 2023, we issued 10 general, which are the, again, to remind you, those are larger events. And we issued 26 minor, so all of our smaller events, and five permits to the Art and Cultural Commission. Next slide, please. Here are 10 of our general, or what would be considered our larger events, and um, there's some new ones on there that we we're impressive that we're be able to that we were able to pull off with Beyond the Flood, Oktoberfest. Um, so, next slide. Twenty six minor special events. It's a lot of events, <laughs> 
And these are on here, the, so the impacts are smaller, but I do want to just throw it in there that, for example, like the Halloween parade, small but mighty, was like, it was a huge turnout this year. So we do support those events. The police department shuts down streets, which is very temporary. Next slide, please. We had six city organized special events, as you can see here. Um, some newer ones that were that came in this year out of, out of response for what we had going on in the winter time. Next, please. So the overall recap, I just would like to publicly acknowledge our, our emergency partners. We have really um, come together jointly to support the community from an emergency standpoint with Central Fire um, doing incident command, meeting with our organizers ahead of time to make sure that we're meeting their needs and that we're uh, being reasonable about what our capabilities are. We have the addition, I, I've had the pleasure of working here when we had a lifeguard program, then we didn't. And now we do again. So that was a new addition, which we'll talk about later at another time about how, what that's going to look like moving forward. Um, we also 321, maybe even on the conservative side, of police hours that went to support the special events. And also 66, which we think that number might be a little low, um, just and that's just communication that we can clean up moving forward between with public works. Um, us communicating with them about how much they're putting in when we have that influx of people that come into our city. Next slide. So to wrap it up, future special event process, we've been working collaboratively with our city attorney. Tamara, thank you for all your help. Um, planning, public works, the recreation with Nikki. Um, to move forward and to look at reviewing and revising our municipal codes, to also streamline the process. The special event process really affects city staff. And to also um, examine and redefine our thresholds for what, what, what qualifies as being a special event. And then also to look at our wording, general versus minor, and um, make that wording a little more... Um, so the public understands what they're asking for when they're coming in for an event. And then also just to review our cost sharing, the fees for staff time, overtime costs, now with the addition of the lifeguard program as well, and what that looks like moving forward. So we'll be coming back to you with um, looking for direction and to give you more information on our collaboration and our, what, we, what we see, how special events really impact the city and all of our resources. Next slide, please. So what we're looking for here is to provide direction regarding any changes to any specific reoccurring special events, permits and conditions, and, deter and also to defer determine if any additional review should be required as we plan to move into 2024 special events. Thank you. Thank you. Any council questions? So that that was a lot of events I know. happening. Isn't it? When you start putting on a slide, it's pretty yeah, amazing. It's, it's yeah. amazing. It's wonderful. I know our community appreciates it. Um, sometimes in the middle of the year, we get additional requests. Um, what what do you think about that moving forward? About the current amount of act, you know, events occurring and potentially more. Well. You know, it, what my thoughts on that are that um, we, we have a lot of special events. And so it, it is a challenge to support much more than we have going. And, and it really depends on the time of the year. Um, it, it was a little odd this last weekend to not really have anything going on. Um, so I would say that I wouldn't want to come up with a hard opinion about what I think about it. It would really, I think we have to be a little bit flexible. Like we added some city events to recover and you just, we don't know what this next year is going to bring in all different ways. So, um, but I definitely appreciate being a part of the conversation because it does put a strain on staffing for the police department and also um, for public works. I mean, all of us that try to support and keep everyone safe while the events happen. 
Um, I'm thinking, I'm looking at our city manager just because of our ribbon cutting for our wharf. That would be occurring next year, mid-year, and I don't see anything on this list referring to that yet. And it'll probably be a substantially large event. I don't know if it's necessary to put that on the docket or, be, you know, because what, what do we have, April, May, 2024? Unfortunately, I'm afraid it's going to be a bit, bit later. Okay. Um, but it's within the, this next year. That's correct. So I do anticipate that, that hopefully we're going to have a fantastic ribbon-cutting event when we open the wharf. That very likely, if it includes the fireworks, which we hope it would, would be a new special event permit. So that would come to the city council for approval. We don't really have any mechanism right now but where you could approve it tonight. Right. Okay. I'm just saying it for future reference that there might be fireworks and a ribbon cutting of a wharf of sorts. You sure possibly so. next year. Well, Monty still has his placeholder in October, but we'll see how things track. Okay. No, so it's not necessary to add anything tonight as um, feedback. Okay. Thank you. Going off of that, are we, for the 75th anniversary, did we list that? We did not list that. Are we doing anything with that? Sorry, if that's not part of this. Again, so so the way the process works is when we have new events, we do bring them to the council. Okay, okay. And so, for example, the Beyond the Flood um, concert did right. come to the council for approval. So if we do end up organizing specific events for the 75th, it will be coming to council. If they're major SCPs, if they're minor SCPs, they can be approved at a staff level. Okay, and I don't know if this is more of a comment or a question, but I kind of how you brought up where there's the general and the, like, I think, yes, there's, maybe we could sort of reword. General just sounds like, <laughs> whatever, you know. So maybe we could intensify the name in, like, a good constructive way and, like, so that, uh, staff and community members understand that it is going to be more of a process or taxing or whatever on staff and that it is a bigger deal than just a general. Right. And we feel that I completely agree with you. And that's sort of what sparked this when we started looking at it, that what what is listed as general to us is like major. Totally. So we want to, we do want to change that wording and streamline the process. So also, so the public's not so confused because we spent a lot of time we are actually our analyst, um, Esmeralda, spends a lot of time answering questions and helping people navigate the process. And that, what that tells us is that we need to deliver the information better. Right. Thank you. Yes, I kind of jumped the gun on my question, but go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Can I ask what the process is? Is it like, do you have to go get a document in person or is there an online form or how, what does that look like? Either. So you can go online. Um, our application right now is a little long. So that's another improvement that we'll be bringing back to you all to, to look at. But they can go online. They can come in person. And depending, we ask a few vetting questions that would put the person in the right direction. Is it a, is it a general or would be a larger event? Or is it something more minor? And um, so they fill out the application. And then depending on the type of event, it's something that may come in front of council um, or like the city manager said, something that we can just approve on our own. And it, it's very fluid depending on what the event is and what kind of permits they need. If they're going to, you know, need the bandstand, if they're going to need an ABC license um, because it's an alcohol related event. So we help them navigate that process. Thank you. And and for a minor event, I'm just curious, what's the turnaround time on approval or denial? Or we have it. I, I'm not going to, I can't remember off the top of my head what the policy is. Um, I think we asked for 90 days, in, I believe. Right. And do you think that's the same for a general? Right. Yeah, okay, thanks. Or your best probably knows. There you go. Any other questions? Okay. We can go to public comment on this item. Is there anybody that wishes to speak? Hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mary Beth Cahalan, and I do one or two events in this village. Um, first of all, we have to thank the wonderful staff that we have that helps. I also sent an email, and hopefully you'll get to read that. 
But one of the things I'd like to do is, if there is a committee of some sort, I would like to be part of the solution. So I do enough of these events, and I have done them for more years than I care to tell you. And we have outgrown the system that Sarah's talking about. And that's basically what she's saying. So one of the things um, I have been working on just in the last couple of weeks is I had two um, invoices come from Esmeralda, who, by the way, I think walks on water. Um, and we had overtime for the police. And we have found that in our permits that the police overtime is almost half of our fees, if not more than half. And I'm not saying we don't, they don't deserve it. The problem is, is we don't know that's what the fee is going to be when we get our bill. So we know how much it is to rent the stage. We know how it's $18 for a parking space. We know it's $70 or whatever for, you know, sound encroachment. We have specifics, but we don't have any guesstimate of what the overtime is for the police, which we need. And, you know, what is it they're actually doing so we know. And so it becomes a surprise bill, kind of, when we get it in the end. And a lot of the events that I do and the rest of the village does, we, we survive on sponsorships. So if we do not um, know what type of sponsorships to go for and how much money we're going to need to host this event, then we are now at a deficit. And then that doesn't leave us anything to start the event the following year. So if we could have a clearer understanding of what these fees are going to be, um, the lifeguard information is on there. Is that part of this or is that another section? <laughs> That's another section. Okay. So um, my thing is, is we need to tie down better what we're getting more bang for our buck, I guess, or what we're getting for the money we are giving. And it's, it's the unknown. Um, I was supposed to have lifeguards. They didn't show up. But that wasn't my decision, and there was no communication to tell me that they weren't going to be there. Thank goodness I had an EMT on site, or I would have had an nautical parade with no emergency. So it's that kind of communication that has to get better between the event planners and the city. I mean, Sarah, Mike, they all walk on water, but um, we do really well. But I'm just saying overall, that's what I see, better communication, and I'd like to be part of the solution. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Council, I am I'm here now speaking as Lori Hill, and um, I was one of many that brought you the Begonia Festival, and I worked under the very beginnings of this special event permit process, and it has evolved. And tonight's report was a great report from the staff perspective. Um, I am hoping because I think the the recommendations of this item are very fuzzy, uh, and I'm hoping that where this is going to go is to create a little bit more of a collaborative process in the discussion of looking at that special event process. Uh, because all the points that Mary Beth made previously um, are, are correct, and uh, I, think, I think some of that can be ironed out in the process. Um, there are a few discrepancies in the staff report, you know, particularly when I looked at the beach festivals invoice for for police fees, and then I looked at what was in the report, and the numbers didn't match. Um, and I and it was it was kind of interesting looking at the difference in the amount of police fees for the various events. I trust staff makes the best decisions for these events, but they shouldn't be surprises um, to the event coordinators, uh, particularly when. Many of the events that are put on in this, this community are put on um, with the, the deep heart of um, a sense of community. And um, it's hard to keep bringing us all back to keep doing this when the pushback feels more like it's not necessarily wanted from the community. And, um, you know, there, there was a time when the Begonia Festival was, was considered very favorable to the, the to the community to the point that when I had to go to the city manager and tell him that 
we had to kill it, his first remark to me was, you can't do that. <laughs> and then I explained there was no begonias going to be coming back. Um, that's how valuable these, some of these, these festivals and events become to a community. So please keep your heart open. You know, I have sensed a real shift in the feelings from the city with regards to some of these activities. And I'm hoping that you keep the heart in the community in Capitola because it is a very special place. And uh, it was mentioned earlier with JoJo's event, that is exactly why we keep coming back. So please make it a favorable uh, situation and let us be collaborators. Thank you. Any other speakers on this item? I'm not seeing any. I can take it back to council. Yeah, I have a, a question for staff. As we look forward and, and move forward, can we work on the um, prediction of how much these are going to cost? Provide that to the people that are putting on these events to make them a little easier so they're not surprised at the end of, uh, you know, they get billed for other things. And we all know that having public safety is the number one thing to have. But uh, it is probably hard when they're getting surprised with, you know, bills that are, and over time, some of those things are always growing. So maybe we should make sure we're letting everybody know. Agreed. I One of the goals moving forward is to send out, um, I, we're working on a timeline to send out a packet to all of our known event organizers so that they can see what the breakdown cost is. As, and as you know, sometimes unpredictable things happen and we have to hold staff over. But being definitely being transparent and open about what that cost is on the front end. I, I agree 100% there shouldn't be surprises. And, That's great. And, and I would like to thank it's the same people over and over that do the most volunteering and would like to thank them for all they do. I just wanted to briefly add that that's one of the things that we're working on in revamping the special events permit process is sort of clarifying what's required of applicants and then what the city expects of applicants. So um, I'm actually glad to hear this input. It's very helpful in, in drafting the new, um, the new kind of permit um, process. So that's, we're working on it. Actually, just have our well, a couple questions and a comment. So, do we have a timeline? You probably said it on when this updated application process will be ready for. Since we have all of these for next year, do we have a, a timeline? Right. What did we set? We set that. Go ahead. So our goal was to complete the update this winter, so that next year we have a new process. In fact, our plan was to introduce the ordinance this evening, and then actually have the first reading at our next meeting. We're not there yet. You know, it got we, we hit a few little bumps in the road, so there's a little bit more work to do. Um, but that's the goal. The goal is is that we have new applications come January, maybe it's January 15th, um, that everyone can use for special events moving forward come, come the new year. And then the second part of the question is, and I'm sure it's in the report, but just for our audience, um, the partners collaborating on the application efforts include PD, our attorney's office, staff at in, within your office, I'm, I'm hoping. Yeah, and, and as well as our rec division and our planning department. So it's not, then I'd like that to make sure. And then community input. Um, not that we need to go out for a large, but we have two very um, dedicated community members here who, have, who could offer a lot of insight. So I don't know that it needs to be a robust process, but I think asking those questions to those who often apply could be really helpful. Um, and I think you're just looking for inputs, right, at this point, to receive and, oh, and approve the reoccurring minor general special events. Um, so approve the recurring list with the caveat that more could come. I mean, that's kind of a weird. Yeah, well, I think the recommendation is actually a little bit more clear on the slide. Okay, um, then read it off. Although I will note that, you know, we're, we're kind of in an in-between stage right now. We are going to have a new ordinance for next year, and this is following up on our old process this last year. So in a sense, it's going to be different next year, but the goal here is just make sure that if everybody's comfortable with the special events the way they were issued last year, 
that's good to know. And if there's one of the special events that needs more scrutiny, now is the time to let us know. I see. Okay. okay. So I, I think I provided my direction. You heard some points on my part. Um, and then we'll see the process come back in January. Um, and if there's any additional review, I think all of the events went well. I heard feedback from the police department about the parade needing a little bit more support. Mm. That's just because it's so lovely and big. I don't know if the sip and strolls were on that list. Um, they probably were, and I just missed it. Oh, they are on here. Okay. Yes. Then those are, that's my direction. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, maybe this is a good time to share that there's a sip and stroll on. Plug. <laughs> uh, so is that okay? Yes. So, I just wasn't 100% uh, clear if you're going to be providing the um, sort of the key for event planners to be able to estimate the price in police overtime for themselves, or if the city staff is going to provide that estimate, because I would prefer the latter to sort of demystify the process as much as possible. Well, both, really. Because I don't know how complicated that formula is, and I just wanted to be clear to people, you know, a reasonable estimate of the cost up front. Yes. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the question's in there. I yes. Yeah, so that is the plan. So we we work with the finance director that gives us a breakdown of what does a police officer cost, what does a public works person cost, and and then we provide that, that number multiplied by how many hours, right? So, and then that collaboration comes with the talking to the event planner, how long is the event? How can we support the event? What does that look like? Um, and like Mary Beth mentioned, so what are you getting? And then us deploying that message back to the people that are assigned to that event so that their mission is really clear, what they're there for and how they're supporting the event. Awesome. That sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I think I just wanted to echo that after hearing um, just so that there's a clear line of like who's involved on that day and maybe what their shift is or whatnot, just so that there's less gray area and more of like a collaboration, I think would just be helpful on both sides. Um, anything else? Okay. I think we got it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we'll go to 7C. This is our Capital Lifeguard season overview. We will receive a report on the Capital Lifeguard service season statistics and approve the proposed operations schedule for future summer and fall sessions. Welcome, Brennan. No one's spoke from this mic yet today okay oh um, <laughs> sorry i went i went to the podium first <laughs> um all right good evening mayor council members um brennan howard and i are here tonight to provide you a report on um our recent past season for our lifeguard service as well as um to get council feedback on um our operation schedule moving forward so we have a little bit of a dual um, presentation. Um, so just to start us off, I'm going to turn myself off and um, just kind of quickly reiterate everything that was just said a second ago, um, where, as you just learned from Captain Ryan, that um, staff from many departments within the city have been working to review the code and policies regarding special events and that by the end of the year, staff intends to bring back to council um, uh, revised uh, municipal code that will hopefully um, also streamline the approval process, uh, redefine thresholds for special events, and then ultimately review the cost sharing um, for staff time. Now to focus, next one please, on um, specifically why we're here. So, Capitola Lifeguard Service completed its um, first season uh, this month, October. Um, as you may remember, the city of, we had previously contracted with the city of Santa Cruz 
um, since 2012. And that this, we're very proud to have this summer or season been our own lifeguard service. Um, much like how we had operated in the past under contract, that season was from Memorial Day weekend to Labor Day weekend and operated seven days a week. Um, however, additionally, in response to kind of what we had observed on our beach um, for the fall seasons, we continued to pro provide service on the weekends until October 15th um, in order to address or to be present for the weekend visitors that attend that are here as well as um, the events, which as you all are aware, all is capital event season. So um, <laughs> um, next slide, please. All right, now, so through this process of developing our own lifeguard service, um, staff has been working with the United States Life Saving Association in order to become our own certified open water lifeguard agency. And breaking news as of this weekend is that we have been approved as a USLA certified lifeguard agency. This, uh, thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> um, so this is a three year certification uh, where our certification will be revisited next in November of 2026. Um, so hold on, Julia. So this, um, as part of our responsibility to the USLA, uh, we uh, need to report to them regular statistics that occur within our season. Um, this information becomes part of a national data collection that informs on um, lifeguard operations in general. And so um, I'm going to turn it over to Brennan Howard here in a little bit, who's going to talk about kind of the overall role of, of a lifeguard service, um, how those statistics um, kind of play out, and then ultimately what we were able to learn from having actual data that occurred on our beach. So I'll turn it over to Brennan. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. So first, we're going to start out fairly simple just regarding what our operation does. So our two main things we do is community outreach and emergency response. These are based out of our two towers, as you can see, Tower 1 and Tower 2. Tower 1 being closer to Esplanade Park, Tower 2 being closer to the wharf. We try to divide the beach in half, but as you can see, middle is not so easy. Um, from there, the zone of coverage for Tower 1 goes all the way almost down to New Brighton and about halfway up to the wharf. And there's a zone of coverage for the water for Tower 2 goes almost all the way up past Hoopers as far as I can see. And then, as you can see, there's also a clear cross where they're covering each other's water and helping each other out. With that, our community outreach comes down to a couple of things. Um, to educate, to guide, and represent the city of Capitola. Not everyone that comes here gets to meet the city attorney or meet a council member. But I can almost guarantee you that anyone that comes to our beach is going to be able to meet a lifeguard. Um, with that, we get to be concierge. We get to answer a lot of questions. So, and hopefully we can guide them before we have to do the second half, which is emergency response, which comes down to anticipation, prevention, and response. So next slide. So for our anticipation, it comes down to some couple simple things. We're going to talk about activities associated with drowning and high-risk populations. So for high-risk, we got youth, males, race, ethnicity, and epilepsy. For males, it's like one in four for youth. I think you're more likely to have a child drown than to, or I think the next closest thing is birth defects, and then it's drowning. So very high risk. Next slide. And then activities associated with drowning. We have swimming, boating, diving, and alcohol consumption. So alcohol consumption specifically has, I think, I believe it's 70% of people that have found who have drowned had alcohol in the system, whether they're youth, whether they're adults, whether they're male, whether they're female, they've had alcohol in the system. Next slide. And that comes us into our next thing that we do, which is preventive action. How can we stop these things from happening before? 
And that comes down to public safety contacts and enforcement. So for our preventive action, our goal is to combat those who may not know they're in danger to a safer alternative with that immediate action, with that immediate conversation. Next slide. So a uh, public safety contact, like I said, is to educate beachgoers. That's all that we are. We're just educators, right? Um, it can educate them on beach and water hazards, unsafe activities, water conditions, or any other general information. Next slide. And enforcement. So although I'm wearing a badge, enforcement is not my job. Um, my job is to educate. So our, all of our enforcement comes in the form of education, right? Um, and our role in enforcement, especially with partnership with PD, is to inform the public on city municipal codes that, they, that are either finable offenses or arrestable offenses. So for us, it mostly comes down to whether their own personal well-being or someone else's well-being is in jeopardy with that, right? And then if they continue to act on those, in those areas, then that's where we would update PD on any beach activity or specific persons that need follow-up on. So that's our daily. And this is something that I see every day is called Watchtower. So for us, for me, this is a digital command center. It does all my legal documentation, all my forms, everything very simple. But for what it does for the city is it does a stat keeping device, right? So it can do large correlations between external factors and calls for service. So it can affect our, it can tell me how our quality of service is. It can document our staff for USLA. And it can show us how we can protect our community in a more significant and better way as well. Next slide. So as you can see, uh, with our end of season stats, um, our contacts are above anything else that we do. We're constantly making sure that those people are safe before we have to do anything else. And then trickles down through enforcement, prevention, minor medical aids, and even above that is boats before rescues. Next slide. Um, another cool correlation is major medical aids and rescues by hour of the day. Bear with me here, it's pretty hard to see, but the top of the slide is basically midnight and it goes down until once again, midnight. So as you can see, most people would think our day would be kind of linear and spread out. In reality, um, it seems that every time at 6 p.m. we're having a major medical or a rescue. So that can attribute to a lot of our overtime, that can attribute to us having late nights, having staffing that's coming home tired because we don't get to choose when we go home. Next slide. Our next one is calls for service and air temperature. So as you can see, as the temperature rises, so do our calls for service. There's more people on the beach, there's more to do. Um, there is a small discrepancy here. We didn't, it wasn't that hot this year. We didn't have many of those severely warm days, but I'm sure as our data grows, we'll be able to see those correlations with it. Next slide. And then one of my favorites, tide height and by rescues and assists. As you can see, it's very right leaning. The higher the tide, typically the more dangerous the situations get, the less options people have. So whether they're up by hoopers and they're in a pocket cove or if they're down at New Brighton and they're getting swept by this longshore current, their options are severely limited just by their land access. So as you can see, as the tide rises and there's less land, it has a, <laughs> it makes my job more apparent. Next slide. The next one is swell height by rescues and assists as well. As you can see, as the swell rises, uh, we are doing more rescues. We're having, we're helping more people out, making sure that they're getting home safe. And now we're going to go into our monthly graphs. So this is our April through October. We're just going to quickly go through all of them. So if you go next slide, May start off really slow. Pay attention to the numbers on the left as we're going to roll through these. I'm going to try and do them nice and quick. Um, it was really slow. There wasn't that much to do. Next slide. However, June, our peak days in May soon became our daily operations with a large spike. As you can see in that junior guard competition, we're almost, we're contacting over 350 people that day. 
Next slide. Um, into July, right? Since the 4th of July kind of fell in the middle of the week, we have two larger spikes where we can see our calls for service for contacts enforcement coming out in the beginning and the end of the, both sides of the week. Um, there's a small anomaly with uh, on June, July 15th and 17th, which is likely a weekend that was hot. And then there's a huge anomaly with July 21st, which I could not tell you what happened, to be honest. Got a moment. Um, for August, our day-to-day -day graph, as you can see, you can clearly see when school gets out, right? Or starts, <laughs> when school starts, right? Our beach tenants drops, our contacts drop, our minor medical aids drop. But as the weekends go on, you can see that every single weekend there's these large spikes, right? Um, August 23rd is an important one too, because that's a Wednesday. So there's a large heat wave and this combined with swell, we end up having a lot of contacts, rescues, enforcements, just making sure that people were safe that day. And September. So now that we're into September, we're only operating on weekends, right? That's all you'll see. So we have Labor Day, this big spike. If you pay attention to the numbers on the left, we're looking at what were similar numbers like June, right? That shows our weather in Capitola or, or fall is warm. So our Labor Day has a large spike. Our Art and Wine also has a large spike. September 16th, 17th, and 18th, I believe, was raining. So there's no spike there. However, the 22nd through the 24th was followed by another large spike. And for October, um, from here, it's basically events that are running, as well as um, correlations of tide and swell. Um, you'll see more correlations here than any other graph of when there's high tides. Basically, we have these king tides on October 17th through the 21st, as well as our swell height increasing, which shows our rescues. Um, at this rate, we're kind of slowing things down. So our contacts, our enforcement, all those little things are dwindling. And I'll throw it back to Nikki. Thank you so much. So as um, hopefully you were able to glean from looking at some of those um, data points is that we, we had a, a really great learning opportunity as to what the activity is like on our beach, what it looks like during that um, mid-August section when, all, when school starts again, um, and how the activity on the beach kind of shifts and changes, and then what our weekends look like um, during, throughout the fall, throughout our event season. Um, a lot of this um, information is really informing us on um, where we need to think about um, the special event permit and policy and, and the questions regarding billing for staff. Um, as you learned from Captain Ryan's previous presentation, we currently bill for staff time for um, special events. And using the information that we were able to get from this um, data, as well as um, the overall operation of having a lifeguard service, it became clear that uh, lifeguard services should be included in the event planning and be considered um, regard during the billing process. Um, particularly when an event will create a very dense crowd, um, usually those kind of events also are likely to include alcohol, um, as well as any events that might have a water element. Um, the size of that event is not necessarily the important factor. It's really more about having a specialized lifeguard um, or a lifeguard specialized for that particular water activity. Um, next slide, please. All right, so I'm going to take a little side step here and just make sure that you guys understand how um, lifeguard staffing works for us. So we typically talk about our lifeguard staffing in regards to Tower 1 and Tower 2. Um, but really what that breaks down into is that on duty, there is a lifeguard lieutenant or supervisor, and there are a total of four lifeguards that would be working during that shift. 
Um, there are two, so, and those lifeguards are typically assigned two per tower. Um, this is the staffing that we have for those, the major peak season during the summer. Um, and we also can think about that through like how dense, how busy we expect the beach to be. Um, now, there are circumstances on our beach where we need to think about the minimum staffing. Obviously, it's a situation where we want to be able to have public safety, um, but the, it, the crowds and the conditions are not of a high-risk situation. Um, we also have situations on our beach where we are, um, our resources are um, missing. So we are a very limited resources for a lifeguard service and we have our towers. There are, um, we have our ends in May, sometimes in situations where the creek isn't able um, to be closed early enough and we don't have the towers out there just yet because of like high rains or um, we might need to pull the towers early um, in October. And so in that situation, we're really thinking about having that minimum lifeguard staffing, which is still that one lieutenant and two lifeguards. Um, now, in regards to events, dense crowds um, increase the risk and demand more attention from lifeguards that are on tower. And so in that circumstance, when we are maintaining that minimum staffing, um, but it increases, that dense crowd increases, something like an event or something like a weather event that might draw people, um, it, really, it really becomes necessary that Tower 2 is in operation. Um, and then also, just as a little point of education, uh, there are circumstances where we might call in additional lifeguards, ones that are not currently on tower, um, in order to support a situation. Some, a lot of times this is like an emergency that requires additional staffing, um, but it could also be that like conditions have changed and the staffing is necessary in that case. Next slide, please. All right. So... In regards to um, events and thinking about billing, um, if we talk about Tower 1 and keeping in mind that there's um, that minimum staffing level of one, one lieutenant or supervisor and two lifeguards, that public safety direct cost is $557 for an eight-hour day. Um, if we were to look at having Tower 2 operational in addition to Tower 1, um, it is a $352 increase. For events, there would be an additional 30% um, overhead that would be on top of that as part of the billing. And then um, in the circumstance that we would need to have additional lifeguards come and support an event, so in a circumstance where there was already a dense crowd and then a weather condition, this uh, kind of changed the dynamic of the beach, um, then additional lifeguards would be billed out at $22 an hour per hour per person with that 30%. Um, overhead. And I will note for council that these rates are based on the current hourly rate. And so as time goes on, these, all these rates gradually increase due to CPI um, wage adjustments. So um, you can kind of think of the operation of Tower 1 and Tower 2 as a direct cost for public safety at $910 um, for the eight-hour day. Next slide, please. All right. So um, as we kind of get into the recommended action, um, we're breaking this information into two parts. We're going to talk about our summer season, and then I'm going to talk about the fall season. So for the um, for council consideration, for the summer season, the recommended option is to operate as in the past, Memorial Day, we, from Memorial Day weekend to Labor Day weekend, seven days a week, operating both towers. So it's basically no change. Um, however, we did learn that the activity on the beach kind of changes mid-August. And so we would um, then adopt having the second half of August potentially reducing our staffing to Tower 1 if the conditions and crowds are favorable for that. Obviously, if there's something going on, we're not sending them home. Um, 
Now, alternatively, if council wanted to consider operating from Memorial Day to weekend to mid-August from seven days a week, that's as an alternative, this would be a reduction of about 14 working days. Um, and I would also just kind of note for council that this is only this is only an alternative because we kind of only have one season of data. And so maintaining our status quo is definitely in our benefit. Uh, next slide, please. All right. And then as we shift to the fall season, um, the recommended option is to operate Tower 1 for beach public safety so that we're there for anybody that shows up. Um, and that scope would begin after the summer season ends and then until mid-October. And then events that require um, Tower 2 staffing would be billed for just for Tower 2. So those two lifeguards that are there. Um, and then any related uh, callbacks to that event. And I will very specifically note that if there was an emergency that required callbacks, the event would not be billed for that emergency. It would be something that was re specifically related to the event. Um, and then of course, events that have water elements. Um, alternative option is to operate um, Tower 1 and Tower 2 for the beach public safety on those weekends. And in this circumstance, events would be billed for water elements and uh, only the callbacks that are specifically related to the event. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so the overall recommended action is uh, to approve staff's recommendation of the operational schedule for summer and fall lifeguard service. And with that, we are available for questions. Thank you. Um, when you say that the events would be billed for Tower 2 staffing, is that for general events or minor events or both? Um, so that's definitely a bigger part of the threshold conversation that still needs to be had. Um, but some of the factors that we would specifically be looking at is whether or not that event is bringing in risk factors um, for our beach. So is it bringing in really large crowds? Is it bringing in really large crowds that are drinking? Um, those kind of risk factors would be part of that evaluative process. Okay. Um, okay, I think uh, everything else I have is a comment. So I'll wait. Um, and maybe this is, so this is a question, but I think it's going to be more worthwhile for the agenda that's passed because you, um, I don't see up here, which would have been helpful, is how many of our events are outside of the range of your staff recommendation today. I think it's going to be important in analyzing the updated process for us because I don't know how many, you know, maybe I would say I want it through end of October instead of mid-October or something like that. Um, if there, if we were to encompass another event hosted by the city, so it could it could potentially not be as expensive for somebody who wants to have an event. Does that make sense? As, mm -hmm. So I don't know that information was provided here or in the other item, but so I guess let me rephrase that question: Are there any events outside of your recommendation that the city hosts out of our large? Um, what was it called? Our larger our event schedule that Sarah presented earlier. Yeah. So, are you going? <laughs> so, so if I if I understand your question, are you asking if we if from Memorial Day weekend to mid October, the full range of what what we're talking about here, mm -hmm. are there any events that are outside of that that would not be addressed? Right, so, because I think your end date, oh, now there's my mic, it came back on. Um, that, I think it, your recommendation was mid-October? Is that what they, can you bring up the? Um, yes, and and so to, to be um, specifically clear about why mid-October was chosen for us is because of, that's the time when things start to get a little unpredictable regarding our towers and, where, and whether or not they're going to be able to be on the beach or, how the, just whether or not we'll be able to be there. But I'll let Sarah chime in on 
the overall event calendar aspect mm -hmm. of your question. Right. So we, yes, the answer to your question is yes. There are a couple events that would fall outside of that date, mm -hmm. like, uh, for example, Women on Waves, mm -hmm. the first responder serve contest. Yep. Um, are any of them through end of October? So I can say if this recommendation is easier, if I can encompass a few more events to save costs for our community members who want to have events, am I, am I making sense here? That I could say begins after the summer season until end of October. Would there be any events to, um, so I know like the sip and stroll is this week, we're in November, so it obviously doesn't apply. Doesn't apply. So if you were to ex request, if I'm understanding you correctly, if you were to request to extend it to the end of October, that would cover events. We're very event heavy in October. Mm -hmm. So do we need to extend that? There's my question. Well, I think, I think in particular, the events that Captain Ryan just listed, um, they are events that do have water elements, and we would still consider them in that water element aspect and provide um, and provide the services to the event. What this is specifically talking about is that during that time that we would provide services to the water element, our public service aspect would not be operating. Right. Right. So we and we may not even have towers available due to whatever the conditions are. Um, so we would still work with the event planner, but the public service piece of having lifeguards on the beach for beachgoers who have nothing to do with the event, that would not be present. Right. And so I guess it's more going to be of a comment later, but I'd like to see a tower up still for like the Capitola parade when we see 200 kids hit the beach. Is that something that we can do tonight by extending it from until mid-October to the end of October? Is that, would that be something I could ask for? The challenge with setting a regular schedule up through the end of October is probably a third of the times the towers need to be off the beach by then. Um, well, then why are you asking us tonight? I'm just curious what the question is. So the primary question that I think we're trying to get to, so this was an interesting experience for us this fall. Because, you know, the way the police department operates for special events is they have the regular staffing and they take a look at the regular staffing. And when there's an event that has requires more than the regular staffing, that's what we charge the special event organizers. And so the, the issue we bumped into this fall was we said, OK. Special events happening on the beach. What's our regular service level this week? And none of us knew because we didn't have a regular service level. So the purpose here is in some ways is to try to set what our regular service, what is the service we should be providing on our beaches? And then, and then we can kind of use that to figure out, okay, that's on the city, that's the regular service, and then what goes to the, to the event organizers. Now, at the end of the day, it will be a policy call for the council to answer is, is about do we want to bill for these services to the special event organizers? We don't have to do that. There are some cities that could say, look, well, I guess I should defer. There may be some legal implications there, but we could say, let's have a different rate or other things. So there are other ways to get at maybe what you're getting after is trying to reduce costs for special event organizers potentially. But what we're trying to do right now is kind of just come up with like, this is our baseline service. And so we know what that baseline service is. It gets a little bit harder for us to commit to a baseline level of service through say Halloween just because of sort of the way the weather kind of rolls in that time of year usually. So I didn't, so my question then is I didn't see any reference to too much from your presentation on weather. I know it was really warm all the way up until Halloween for the last, well, I have a nine year old. So for the past nine years, Halloween has been pretty darn warm. So how did you, did you look at weather at all when you were coming up with these I know this last year, this is our first year of looking at it this kind of, but was that taken into account instead of doing mid-October to the end of October? And I'm only using that as an example because I just want to, you're asking us a policy question of when do we, how long should we have this for, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, def weather was a large part of the consideration. Um, and the public service piece of what is before you is why it's why it's even being considered because um, it's very clear that we do have 
a regular flow of individuals that are coming to our beaches because the weather is still nice. They're just coming here on the weekends as opposed to have been coming during their summer vacation. And so that regardless of what's happening for events during that September and October season, uh, this is proposing that we are providing that public service by staffing Tower One through mid-October. And, and then what city manager Jamie Goldstein was saying is that um, the conditions on the beach become variable and we're not, we can't always be assured that the towers will be present. Um, but, I mean, we had lifeguards out after <laughs> that October 15th date just a few weeks ago because the conditions were necessary for us to have staffing out there. So just because um, we're, we're setting these parameters doesn't mean that our staff isn't going to go when necessary. Yeah, I'd like to add to that our request a little more. It is important that you probably have staffing through October because October is one of our nicest months out of the whole year. Even if we don't have a tower due to the waves and the eroding beach, but if we had service through the end of October, I think it would be important. And then add when there's extras and then to go from there. But. Okay. So maybe, maybe what I'm hearing the council suggest is that we extend the regular season through the end of October. And we probably just need a caveat in there that, you know, it may have, it may not be feasible to have the towers up through the end of October, but our plan is to have the regular service through the end of October. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? That was my recommendation is that we extend, extend it to the end of October. We know we've had pretty great weather. We know that there's a lot of people here, regardless of what events are occurring. We just know that there's a need in the community to have you all on the beach for a little bit longer. We're lucky enough to have good weather through October. I think the caveat's great. Um, and I think it's important that we say that today. So then when you go back to the updating of the process, it's clear that we have towers on the beach from this month to the end of October. And it's really clear because mid October can mean anything, <laughs> you know? Can I say that I, I feel like, are we getting hung up on the whole tower situation? Like if for some reason the towers do need to be removed for whatever reason, but we do still have presence of our lifeguards. I mean, that is, is that part of this? Is that okay? Or is that too like gray, gray area? I don't know. No, I, I, that is correct. Yeah. That, okay. that if conditions required us to pull the towers, because okay. we never know conditions could require us to pull the towers at the end of September. Right. Um, but that we can ha plan to staff every weekend through October, um, even if we are sorely limited on resources. And then is there ever the case where you guys like call people off if there's like not, if maybe only the supervisors needed or? That would, if we would reduce staffing, if it wasn't Yeah, necessary. just if, you know, if, the event isn't going to be heavily attended or the weather permitting. Yeah, I can elaborate that in a little bit. Yeah. Um, if weather permitting, we will reduce our staffing level, but we'll, like what Nikki was saying earlier, we'll keep people on callback. So they're off for the day, yeah. but they're expected to stay close, make sure that their phone's on basically, so we can, okay. if we need them. Are they paid for that? Um, not necessarily. It's kind of like how paid call service works. So okay. it'd be like you're off for the day, you don't have necessarily accountability to come back immediately but we have a list of people that are on call for that day okay okay so, thank yeah. you yeah and so my last question is about the overhead is 30 percent standard for all of our programs or is it just 30 percent overhead for the lifeguard program is that our fees and all of that sort of stuff oh we gotta pull, pull in the <laughs> we've it's been a while it's been a while <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Yeah, thirty percent is the standard overhead rate for all of the fees that we charge in recreation. I think that's pretty much what we're using in um, PD right now. Um, if you recall, we're also doing a fee study right now, so that may change. Okay. As a result of that study. Okay, so this could potentially change for the next year in terms of the overhead costs. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. Nice to see you. <laughs> I have a question. Um, is the staffing change at all depending on if the towers are able to be on the beach or not? Like the staffing requirements for an event? Like lifeguards. Yeah, so um, we will, uh, during that term of service, we will always try and maintain that minimum level of staffing, that one lifeguard lieutenant or supervisor and two lifeguards. Um, depending upon the type of event, how dense that uh, crowd will be, or um, if the circumstances required additional, then yeah, we would, the event, with the event, we would plan to add two more, and it would be hard, I would imagine, if we didn't have towers, but we would still try and maintain that um, level of staffing. Same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then um, are any of the minor events, um, would those be required to the, the additional tower, tower two, or is this just for general events? I, I I think that that some of that work still needs to be done. But I mean, if we look if we look at the data that we had from this past year, um, you know the if the events stay the same, then we can kind of easily point them out. Um, my understanding through the special event permit process also is that. Sometimes events have been elevated. They have started off at a certain level, and then because they were such a popular event, then they got elevated. And so I think within that process, too, you know, if if we're considering it's already been a minor, but then suddenly it gets to be a larger event, then we would be considering lifeguard staffing in a different way in response to that. So you're basically going to develop a table with thresholds of how many people require how many personnel? That has been part of the conversation, yes. There's There are two events, two minor events, Operation Surf and Good Friday Paddle Out. But, but those events are different. I mean, I think it's always good yeah. to think about, like, the events that are in the water. You know, they may be a minor event, but we might need to have two lifeguards for them. And there are events that aren't in the water, right? But there's just the village is packed, everybody's drinking, it's a big party, and we really need to make sure we have a lot of staff on the beach. So that second category of kind of things, I think those really, yes, it would need to be a major special event before we're talking about staffing up Tower 2. Could be a minor event, may need lifeguards, but that's probably because they're, people are in the water. Okay, um, so I, I just want to clarify. Um, so it was mentioned that this is about events happening on the beach, but I'm assuming that means close to the beach. So I'm hoping that we can have some kind of objective standards at some point of does that mean any event along the Esplanade? Does that mean any event in the village? Does that include Upper Village? Because um, I heard someone say something about the sip and stroll, and just off the top of my head, it doesn't seem like the sip and stroll needs a lifeguard. City clerk, can we get the, the slide that showed the data for the summer visitation and contacts? I think that that, that, <laughs> I think that might help, help explain. I think when you start to see the, the, the event and the data, that's, I think, the threshold. That, that's the kind of threshold we're thinking about that would be incorporated into our special event permit. Yeah, that's, what, that's just what I'm hoping is that at some point we will have objective standards that is this number of, of people, it is this far from, it is this many feet from the actual water. Um, and you mentioned object, you know, risk factors as well, right? Objective standards for risk factors, the size of the crowd. Is this an, a bottomless mimosa event where people are just drinking all day and can go wherever they want? Or is this a, there's a five drink limit, you know, whatever the case may be. <laughs> yeah, can, can we get one more, one more data? There we go. <laughs> So I think when we look at the data for September, you can see where the special events lie. And I think, you know, the second most busy weekend that we had all summer was the Art and Wine weekend. And so that, that's, I think, what we're talking about when we're talking about the data. The, the event is showing up in the data. Right. I understand that the event is showing up in the data. But what I'm saying is if we're asking, if we're determining how much staffing there needs to be of a lifeguard, and what we're saying is, well, it depends on the risk factors and it's happening on the beach. Well, 
there's no objective risk factors that we are checking a box and saying this, it meets this risk factor. It's a crowd of over 200. It meets this risk factors. There's no limit on the amount of drinking. Like, or, you know, art and wine, you can buy as many tokens as you want. So I get that that's a risk factor, right? Sip and stroll, you can only get a certain number of tickets. So it's not an unlimited drinking day. And then also art and wine does go all the way up to the Esplanade. Sip and stroll, as far as I remember, there's no shops directly on the beach that are serving. So you would be one street back. So this is what I mean is if we need some kind of check, you know, check the box and not just someone going, well, this is an event near the beach. So we might need more lifeguards because then there's no way for people to know, you know, if they're going to be subject to this lifeguards, the additional lifeguards or not. Yeah. So um, creating sort of objective uh, criteria by which both staff and the public know when certain events will require lifeguard services, what types of uh, information they're gonna have to provide to the city to obtain a special event permit. All of those sort of objective criteria is part of the process that we're going through right now in doing this whole revamp. So our goal is to come back to council with um, a clearly organized um, set of procedures that are going to allow, it's just, I, my hope is that it'll just make the whole process a lot clearer and it'll make it very obvious um, what types of events can take place in these areas, what types of information the applicant, applicants will need to provide and what services the city will be requiring and providing for those events. Okay. And then final, did I hear correctly that we're billing $900 a day? Did I hear that right? Or did I just... For lifeguard services? Yeah. I thought I heard something somewhere about like nine hundred dollars a day. So if you the, if you that was for the second tower. Yeah, it, if you look at the city's direct costs, that that total. Yeah. Um, but no, the there's the portion of that that the city is responsible for as the public safety aspect, which is the tower one. So that one lifeguard, lieutenant, supervisor, and two lifeguards. The addition of Tower 2 that would be necessary to support a large event, um, that billing, the direct cost is $352 with the 30% overhead. And then the, any additional callbacks that might happen would be billed at the per hour per person rate of that hourly person, plus the 30%. So it would be $900 I see 910 and 24 cents. Um, if there aren't, if Tower One is not set up, if it's outside of that October window, then you would pay the whole nearly $1,000 per day. As of today, we don't have any events outside the window that would necessitate Tower One and Tower Two. So I think, I think, I think. The best way to think about this is that we'd be going, first off, a lot more service than we've ever provided in the past, right? We used to be seven days a week from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Now we're going to be able to provide services through the fall and the weekends, which is a great benefit for our community and for public safety. And then the plan right now, as I'm, I haven't heard the motion yet, but what I'm hearing most of the council members say is, let's plan on regular service on Tower 1 through the fall. And then what staff is proposing is, this point it's probably just one event that would trigger the threshold for tower two service and that would be two days of tower two service at about what is that about 450 a day um, for that one event um so do you need a motion today because it sounds like you're getting a lot of direction and this is for summer and fall and we're waiting for the criteria all of it to come back to us which would be inclusive of the lifeguard I do you want to also just remind the council we haven't taken public comment on this item? Yeah. <laughs> that was, um, but that I was have another question. question. We, we would prefer to be able to set the schedule for lifeguards. And then, I mean, the conversation about the special events is obviously much broader. But the purpose here was to kind of set our sort of typical schedule for our lifeguard services um, so that that is done. That is our preference. Okay. Those are all my questions. Great. I have a question. Julia, could you pull back the art and wine slide? Did you want to see the, the data? Or? Uh, yeah, the data. My question was, I, I can't really tell the color difference between those. It looks like it's like purple, orange, and red. 
Um, and those three humps on the three weekends look like they're about the same value, except for the contact is much higher. But are those three different colors? I can't tell from here. Um, so it's like, what do those represent? Yeah, I can help with that. So they're, they're, that light color is like a yellow, and that's yeah. the highest point there. Not the yellow. Um, and that is representing the number of contacts that occurred. Mm -hmm. And then the... Cool. Um, <laughs> and then the, the lower one there, which I can't even tell. It's probably red or pink, um, is uh, enforcement. That missing person for all three of those humps? No, it's not missing person. It's enforcement. Oh, it's enforcement. Okay, yeah. and all three of those are the same. And all three of those, yeah. So oh, you're approximately looking at the each, same. Yeah, each one so. of those high points on that graph. The top one is of yellow is contact, and then the one below in that reddish so in, color is enforcement. What was on September twenty third? What was that event? The twenty twenty second to twenty fourth. It looks like. Oh, okay. So that was a big event. Okay. Yeah, I was just unsure if those were just like kind of normal weekends compared to the art and wine because I think like the art and wine really goes to show that if there's a ton of more people, you have a lot more contact, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we need more lifeguards, right? I think if we're basing the need for lifeguards, you should base that off of the need for, you know, enforcement, minor medical aid, missing person, prevention, but... I mean, the contact doesn't really seem to correlate to those actual needs. But please, you know, feel free to respond to that if, if that assumption is incorrect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the purpose of a public safety contact is to directly prevent something from happening. So for me, um, what I was introduced to as a guard, which is the culture has changed significantly, was that you're not going to talk to someone unless you have to. I have obviously destroyed that in my lifeguard service. I don't think it's productive whatsoever. But with that, it doesn't mean that we're not going to talk to people for the sake of talking to them. We're talking to them for a good reason. Most of that time, it, become, it comes down to them either doing something simple like playing on rocks, right? If you combine that with the Art and Wine Festival, maybe they're inebriated, and now they're cracking their head open. Right. That for me is a statistics. That's a tick mark. So every little contact, whether it's big or small, those things can ripple down into much larger things. So even if it's a 20 foot day at Capitola and we're coming up and talking to someone saying, hey, what's your entry and exit strategy? That's a contact. So it's a very broad spectrum. So I understand how it can seem like that's not a big deal. It can be brushed over. But the more we can do those little things, the better our service is, and it makes my lifeguards safer. Say that it does have a very direct correlation to injuries and rescues. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, it was just interesting that the art and wine has such a higher level with a similar level of incidents, but a much higher level of contacts. Why can you um, give any idea why that might be? Um, it probably comes down for, I wasn't there that day, but I would assume that came down to education of beachgoers on the effects that alcohol can have on your system when you're in the water, right? We pulled up that stat initially that all of everyone that drowns, 70% of those are under the influence of alcohol, whether you're a child whether you're an adult, whether you're male, whether you're female, 70% of everyone that's drowned in the U.S. has out, had alcohol in their system. So personally, like for us, it's like we love that you get to enjoy the beach, but we need you to respect yourself and others in these parameters. So I, I would assume that it came down to them making sure that those people are acting appropriately and staying within that public safety boundary. Well, and the attendance of that event is much larger than like the beach festival and things like that. I don't, I 
I don't have any more important comment. <laughs> any other questions from council? Okay, public comment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I love data. That's good stuff. I watched this man during that high surf uh, in October. I saw him in action. I was deeply impressed, and I told him so later. What I'm not impressed with tonight is we've gone from an insufficient lifeguard service. We knew that, and great steps have been made to improve on that. And I'm very proud of our community for doing that. So we're going from this to over here. Fine, it's more safety on our beaches. But we're talking about September and October, the two best, year, uh, best months of our entire uh, beach season. And I really challenge that data to really support that many of these special events are driving the costs of the people being on the beach and driving the, be the people to come to the beach. I'm sorry, we live in a beach community. It's a popular beach community. It's particularly popular for people over in the valley. It's a busy place. We have an entire tourist community built upon that. Please make this a general fund expense Make it a general fund expense if you feel like you need to staff up. Please do not put it on the backs of the nonprofits, many of which are only out there to bring people to Capitola, to enjoy Capitola. We've moved our festivals to those two months because we were asked to get off the summer because the village wanted us there. Please don't penalize us. Thank you. I agree with Lori. First of all, I know a lot about the art and wine. I've done it over 20 some years. And yes, we do have trouble with your alcohol, but I think it's interesting that now we're finding it's a problem with the lifeguards and we've never had that problem before. Uh, so you're talking almost $1,000 per event that you're raising the event permits for. And these, we barely, we make no money on the beach festival and Labor Day and the beach festival were the same. The Begonia Festival used to be on Labor Day. Great. The businesses asked us not to have the Beach Festival there anymore, so we moved it to the end of the year. The whole point of these vest festivals is to bring business, people to bring business into the village. The Sip and Stroll, that's the purpose of the Sip and Stroll. The Oktoberfest, that was on your list. Well, Joe, how was the surf that weekend? It was the best they had. That's why we had all those surfers out there. They weren't there for the event. They were there for the surf. So how do you judge what the people are there for? So if you're going to have all these events pay, it's back to what Lori said originally, you're acting like you don't want the events within the community. So I think the general fund is a great idea to pay for this. I think you should have a longer beach time anyway with the lifeguards because our weather is better. I mean, you know, start in, you know, June instead of May. Uh, nobody's out of school till June anyway. <laughs> but anyway, that's just my point, and I feel that you guys will do what you have to do in the best, but if you get to the point where your fees are so high, all these events will have to go away because our sponsorships are not coming through anymore. And businesses are hurting, and we are struggling to continue. Thank you. Thank you. We don't see any other members of the public here. Any other comments from council? Lower log. All right. Um, I'll approve staff's recommendation for the operational schedule for summer and extend the fall through the end of October for lifeguard services. I'll second for discussion because I have one more question. Do we have an idea um, or would it be possible for us to get an idea when all the event and permit stuff comes back to us of what the fiscal impact would be of not charging for this? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I was thinking that same thing when getting the public comment. It's really a separate question, um, but we can bring that information and you can make the call. I mean, at the end of the day, 
you know, it's not me or Nikki that's paying for the lifeguards in one case or somebody in the audience event organizer paying. It's either the residents pay it out of the general fund or the event organizer. So that's a policy question that we can have when we talk about the, the SEPs themselves. Yeah. I, I would definitely want to revisit. I thought it was a really interesting point that the events were moved from summer to fall. And because if we implement these fee structure during fall, and then the events move back into summer, then we just have a dead period in the village, which we definitely don't want, right? So it almost, yeah, definitely, I think, could use some more consideration. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on how lucky we are to have our own lifeguards. Um, on that big swell that we had, it was the middle of the week when no lifeguards were on duty, and the, the chief saw how big the waves were and how we were stopping people from going out and saving people from getting washed away on the beach, and our, our lifeguard showed up, so. We wouldn't have gotten that if we were still with the city of Santa Cruz. So that's great. Good stuff. Okay. So we have direction and a motion. Okay, we have a roll call, please. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Brown. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Thank you. Passes unanimously. This will take us down to. Item 7D, the citywide housing element adoption. Do we wanna take like a two minute, a, a, a restroom break? Okay, brief little break. We will start back up with 7D, our housing element. Welcome back, Director Hurley. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council. Before you tonight, I'm very excited to be presenting the adoption of our housing element. Next slide, please. Um, so tonight's topic, so we'll be talking about what is a housing element. You've seen those slides before, so I'll go fast through those. Uh, where we are in the process with HCD update and adoption. Um, introductions, tonight we have um, from RRM Design, I don't think Brett Stinson's not on the call tonight, uh, he wasn't able to make it, but we've got Veronica Tam of Veronica Tam and Associates, and then we also have Layla Chora Dinesh uh, from Burke, sorry, <laughs> um, and uh, Layla's been a, a big part of this team as we've moved through this. So I've added her to this slide because um, we couldn't have, we couldn't be where we are today without her. So next slide, please. Um, so what is a housing element? It's one of the eight elements within a within your or seven required elements within the general plan. And our deadline to complete our housing element and have it submitted to the state is December fifteenth, and it really plans for how we're going to provide housing. Um, as we know is needed in Capitola. Next slide, please. So where are we in the process? Tonight we're here to discuss adoption of our housing element. Um, next slide, please. Um, this slide's very important. There's been a lot of public outreach during this, pro um, during this process. Um, thank you all for going through, like being active participants through all the presentations through the past year. We started off with stakeholder meetings. We, I was thinking tonight about that joint planning commission and city council meeting that feels like forever ago. Um, so a lot of meetings, lots of opportunity for the public to, to provide comment, which they have and which has been incorporated into the document. Next slide, please. Um, we're now on to our sixth draft of the housing element. So here, here we are. These are all available on our website if anyone's curious and wants to look back, but they're all there. <laughs> um, next, the Planning Commission at our last meeting on, we had a special meeting on October 19th. During that meeting, meeting there was a unanimous recommendation that the City Council adopt the housing element. We received comments from HCD prior to this meeting that were in, that the Planning Commission asked us to incorporate into the housing elements. So in the latest draft that you've seen with the green highlights, all of those green highlights are uh, relative to those comments from the HCD and Planning Commission recommendation. Next slide, please. Um, so since um, the Planning Commission recommendation, we actually got more comments from HCD, which I'm going to present to you tonight. Um, and we've 
updated the housing element with a new color, gray, of highlights for in response to the HC. I think we ran out of colors for our highlights, <laughs> so we're on to gray. Um, so one item was to update the religious facility sites. We had to clarify exactly how we got to those numbers and also to add a commitment to reevaluate in 2027 if we're not seeing progress there. Also with the mall, they also asked us to um, add that within our strategy for program 1.7 to state that we'll look at additional strategies, including rezoning if development is not achievable. So we've added that to the latest draft. And then in, on the state sites, they simply wanted us to reference the Surplus Land Act. So that is in the updated draft. Next slide, please. And then um, this slideshow changed from last night to today um, because we did receive a comment later, letter late in the afternoon yesterday from Malone Geyer, the owner of the mall. Um, and I just want to clarify a few items there. So within their letter, they, um, they said the city, our assumptions were based on their 2019 submittal. The housing element is over 500 pages, or it's just under 500 pages, I think. And there's a lot of information in there. And I don't think they, um, they maybe missed the sections of where some of our estimates came from. But there's six different um, examples in there of developments that have 29 units or more that are under the 40 foot height. So it is doable. We do have evidence in there that those that are arena can be accomplished within the sites that we've included in our housing inventory. So um, next slide, please. Merlon Geyer also commented on, um, we have a new program 1.7 for the mall redevelopment. And um, they commented that we've got a a commitment to do our land use study, which is underway now. It should be completed in probably February or March of next year, um, so early next year. And they commented there's this study happening, but then there's a new commitment for a 2027 reevaluation. Re and what that was missing, and I've highlighted with the arrow, is we're committed in 20, by 2025, by December of 2025, to update our zoning code to incorporate what we learned from that study into our, into our code or whatever type of um, action needs to be taken at that time, if it's a specific plan or some other tool outside of the code. But that commitment is in there. So we're um, putting those response comments to those last two items. We'll update the housing element to have responses and clarifications on those two items. And then lastly, if we can go to the next slide, um, Malone Geyer, listed three items that they'd like to see us take action on. One is an increased maximum building height to 75 feet. Um, in response to that, the land use study will look at that. We'll look at increased height. Um, the second thing was floor area ratio to 2.0 and to exclude parking from the calculation. Um, it's my opinion that within our existing code, if you're doing mall redevelopment, that's, you, it's a community benefit. It's listed as a community benefit, so therefore they would be um, allowed to use the 2.0 FAR. Um, we're suggesting tonight that we clarify that within the update to make it really clear that redevelopment would get a FAR of 2.0. And then in terms of excluding parking from the FAR calculation, that's something we should look at in our land use study, but it, tonight I'm not going to recommend that we include that at this time. Um, I think it should be studied. And then establish a minimum density of 29 per units. Right now within the regional commercial, there is not there is no minimum density and there's no maximum density. So um, we see that as uh, very developer friendly in terms of you need to build within the height and setbacks and parking requirements of the code, but there's no density limit. So if you wanna do a lot of smaller units, you can achieve higher densities. Um, next slide, please. So on this slide, I have the staff recommendation for this evening. I also have, I'm quickly going to show you a PDF of the changes just so they make it into the record for tonight for the document. Um, so this is where you'll see our new gray highlights on <laughs> the latest changes. So. Okay, so the first one is just, the first two slides are just 
referencing the responses that we're going to include to Merlon Geyer. Those are the first two slides. The next slide, uh, it was just a reference to, um, I think, the state requirement for the um, surplus. Next slide, please, or next page. This um, is just adding that for the mall redevelopment that will, will, within the strategies, will include but not limit it to rezoning to meet the arena if necessary in 2027. Next, slide, next page. This is the, just our commitment to reevaluate within the, um, the religious sites if we haven't met our, yeah, if we haven't met our goals. Reevaluate. This one I'm not seeing any gray, so that might have been an accident. Um, and this is just the reference to the Surplus Land Act that the HCD asked us to put in. Um, and this is how we came up with our numbers for the religious sites. So the, it's 8.7 units per acre, and it turns out to be 10 units total between two different religious sites. Next. And this is, again, that reference to the 10 units total, um, which was developed with the assumption of 8.7 dwelling units per acre, which is our R1 zone. I think that's the end of it. So with that, um, if we could go back to the slide, with the staff recommendation. Um, tonight we're asking that you move forward with the staff recommendation. There's three steps to it. The first step is to adopt the addendum to the general plan EIR and the six cycle housing element, and then goes into more detail about the changes that I just brought up, and also to authorize the community development director to make non-substantive changes to the housing element for HCD certification. The second um, recommendation is to update the attachment two to the resolution to reflect the edits to the text on the pages listed, as well as the recent amendments due to the mall um, amendments. And thirdly, to direct staff to file a notice of determination and submit the housing element to the state of California for certification. And because this is a very cumbersome, um, a very long staff recommendation tonight, and it would be appropriate to move staff recommendation unless you have any changes to the recommendation. And with that, I'm available for questions. Questions? I just have two quick questions. Um, great job. Glad that you addressed the Merlin Geyer issues. Um, first question is when is the land use study going to be completed? So the land use study is underway currently by Cosmont, and we will um, move, we'll, it'll be completed. We first want to get our housing element certified. Uh, that was direction given at council during the last meeting, and then following that, we'll begin the process of meeting with the. Um, the technical committee and making the study public. So right now they're doing their fact finding and research. So do I think we it's probably it? January, February. Like, yeah, spring. Yeah, right. early next Perfect. year. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. That's it. <laughs> I know that um, they were related. They were both answered. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is about the 2027 follow-up date for the religious sites. Um, do we have a general uh, goal of reviewing our progress just for the entire housing element? Are we, what date is that? So, what year is so that? annually we have to okay. review our housing element. So I'll be doing the annual review. It happens, um, I have to submit the update to the state every April 15th, or maybe, okay. maybe it's April 1st, but... Um, are you concerned that we're, we have, I mean, we do it annually. Is it a problem to have a 2027 date just for one portion of the housing element where that we're identifying? You know what I mean? It's just kind of interesting that they would just want to be highlighted for that particular, for those particular sites. Yeah, I think these are two items that the HCD is very concerned about. So there's new legislation that passed regarding religious sites more recently. Um, so I think they want to have us relook at that, and um, so I think it's more 
just to make sure something's happening on those sites where they're putting a lot of emphasis there on the state, right, at the state level right now. In terms of the mall, it has been a huge focus and it is a lot of our units that are called out for RENA. So I think that, that's why we're also checking in for the RENA. For and the I know that we try to stay away from things that are too specific, like years possibly. Do you think that'll be a problem when, um, by approving tonight the housing element with those two items being so specific for 2027? No, I think it, it's a good time to check in. Um, the first three years are really when we have to uh, implement all the strategies that we've outlined, that we've laid out, and we have something like I think seventy-nine items that we're committing to. Some, but there, there, some of those are uh, the continuation of things we already do within our code. So, um, but twenty twenty-seven will be the the right year once we've checked all the other boxes for the other. Okay, that's all. Thank you. One more question. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, like, when, what would be the timeline if we did need to change, like, the height or something like that based on the land use study? Like, when could that happen? Sure. So if... How long would it take? Yeah. So if the land use study came back in, we'll say, February, and it said that we should move forward with a modification to the height, it would require that... Um, we go through a process that we involve the planning commission for a recommendation to the city council. And so go through and going through like the city council adoption process, which I would estimate we're, we're probably going to do a package of things at that time. Um, so maybe the best case scenario is somewhere between three, three to five months, but that's a really best case scenario. And then because the mall site is not in the coastal zone it would it would take effect immediately after that three to five months if we had really substantial changes that required an eir then that would be a longer process because we'd be hiring consultants to um if, if we were to do a specific plan for instance if they said that was the direction we should go that would require an eir you're actually like entitling the the property and that would take a lot more time so that you're looking at like i think a minimum of a year for an for a specific plan, if not longer. Yeah. Between the middle of 24 and the beginning of 25, something like that. <laughs> yeah, but zoning zoning changes that wouldn't require an EIR would be fat, like yeah. three to five months. That's great. Thank you. I don't see anybody here for public comment. So we'll take it right back. Move to approve staff recommendation. Second. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, sorry. I got distracted by the screen. Uh, we have a first and a second. We have a roll call, please. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Brown. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thanks for all your hard work. Thank you. I'd like to just clarify um, that I'm not sure if everyone saw on the agenda that public comment would not be taken through Zoom this evening. Um, and just wanted to clarify that. Um, Thank you. But that there was a public uh, comment period that was open and closed just prior to the vote. So thank you. Thanks. Okay, 7E. Fiscal year 23-24 city fee schedule. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Yes, this next item before you is an amendment to the 23-24 fee schedule. Next slide, please. Um, so just by way of background, as you know, all know, we review the fee schedule each year, and this year we adopted our fee schedule on June 22nd of this year, 2023. That same evening, we also adopted Ordinance 1061, which was an amendment to the local, uh, to the LCP, which um, was requesting an increase to parking meter rates. That ordinance needed to be certified before we could actually increase the rates, and we kind of wanted to time up the rates with the permits. Um, so we received certification on the ordinance in August, and now in order to implement the last um, recommendation from the Temporary Village Parking Committee, is to amend the fee schedule, next slide, to the parking permit program as listed up there. So the transferable permits for hotels and motels would increase from 50 to 365. 
surf and coffee permits increasing from 50 to 55, and the number of permits issued for um, surf and coffee, 75 to 100. And again, these were all the recommendations from the Temporary Village Parking Committee. Next slide. And with that, the recommended action is to adopt the proposed resolution amending the fee schedule. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions, anybody? Any comment? No. Okay. Deliberation, comments? So, move to adopt the resolution amending the fee schedule for fiscal year 23-24. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. May we have a voice vote, please? All those in favor say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to 7F, amendments to Title II Administration and Personnel. The recommended action tonight is to introduce by title only, waiving further reading of the text, an ordinance of the City of Capitola amending chapters 2.04 and 2.08 of the Capital Municipal Code. All right. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. I am back to present you with this ordinance amendment. Just as a quick background refresher, the City Clerk is tasked with the maintenance of the City's Municipal Code. As a general best practice, reviews are recommended for all sections of the Municipal Code. So this is something that I would encourage you to expect moving forward. It's one of staff's um, projects to kind of take a look at the code and make sure it's up to date. So before you tonight is a review and a recommendation to revise Title II, which involves 16 chapters, including chapters related to the powers and duties of the city manager and the city council. As I mentioned, regular review of city codes is considered a best practice because it allows staff to identify outdated or ineffective provisions or language. Um, in this case, staff conducted a review and identified several areas that they recommend for update. As a part of this review, there's also an administrative policy, policy I-15, called agenda preparation, which details all of the individual processes for creation of a city council agenda. The entire policy is out of date and pertains to a practice that is no longer implemented and a software that's no longer in use. So staff would recommend um, repealing this policy once this code update takes effect. A brief summary of changes. The first section is referencing the city council. The city council elected to make a change from mayor pro tempore to vice mayor, so that would be a change reflected in the code language. There's also an updated adjournment time from 7 p.m. to 6 p.m. because of the meeting change time. And we are also recommending removal of the language regarding the appointment of standby city council members, as this is a practice that's no longer used by our city council. Uh, continuing this summary, we also want to codify current practices for public participation in meetings. So this is something that is currently in effect. We use this language in our agendas and we tell members of the public that this is how they can participate in meetings in the public comment. And so staff recommends putting that language into the city code so it's really clear how members can participate on non-agendized items and agendized items on the agenda. There's also language um, added into the code about how items would be pulled from the consent calendar and how the city council would be the ones making the decision to pull those items as a part of their motion. In addition, there's several minor changes throughout the code chapter, some um, updates to the city attorney chapter to reflect current powers and duties. The public works director appointment had referenced a practice from the 1970s that the city manager would act as the public works director. It's no longer recommended and so we removed that. The director of finance, there was some old language referencing the redevelopment agency that's also been removed. Um, and then the city manager, there was an old bond requirement that the city manager would have to carry a bond. The code had actually already previously been updated to remove that in a different section and it just wasn't aligned with both chapters. And then finally there's old commission names that are no longer active that was also removed. So the recommended action this evening is to introduce by title only waiving further reading of the text and ordinance which would amend these chapters of the municipal code and I am available for any questions. Questions? Um, two questions. One is for the public participation at meetings um, where it says if an 
a comment on agendized, I know, uh, removing the item for consent would be moved to the end of general, but sometimes we may have it on a different agenda. And so I'm just curious whether we want to be more. Um, so there is honest. language within the code already that states that the mayor or chair of the meeting can reorganize the agenda um, with the concurrence of the city council. So this would still be in line with that, that if the mayor or the chair of the meeting, if you guys pulled an item from consent, and then typically it would fall at the end of the agenda, but the mayor has the discretion to reorganize the agenda um, as the council sees fit. Okay, um, I'm wondering if, and I can bring this back, if we wanna ha include that language in this, or if it's necessary. I guess I can ask you, is it necessary to just be more general and specific in this? Are you asking if, the council could like continue an item that's pulled from consent to another meeting versus putting it at the end? I mean, I, I know that's the answer. I'm just wondering, it's really specific here in item C that removing an item, any council member may pull an item from the consent. Items pulled from the consent calendar will be considered following general governmental items or government items. I'm just wondering if we shouldn't be so specific here. Um, it, I think it would be reasonable for the code to read as it does and then the council has the discretion gotcha. to continue an item to a later a later date okay thank you um and then tomorrow were you was your office able to look at these updates yes Excellent. we you. reviewed them before um publishing thank you mm -hmm. thank you any other questions public no okay back to council deliberation Move approval of uh, staff recommended changes. I'll second. Thank you for all your work on this. Good job. Thank you. May we, let's do another voice vote. We're on a roll. All those in favor say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you. That'll jump us down to item eight, which happens to be adjournment. So we will adjourn to the next city council meeting on November 21st, 2023 at 6 p.m. Thank you, everybody, for all of your hard work. Just a reminder, it's a Tuesday meeting. Oh, it's a Tuesday. Tuesday meeting. Get it in there. 21st. Woo.